<laughs> I guess some people are smiling at the title. <laughs> more caches. Who wants more caches? Nobody? <laughs> I'm serious. If you don't want more caches, I'll skip. <laughs> okay, raise your hand if you want more caches. Okay, good. <laughs> That's. I know people are always interested in caches. <laughs> It's good to learn, of course, yeah. But I cannot teach you everything about caches even in a semester, probably. There's a lot in caching. But I'll give you some basics. And there's a lot more, of course. We may, we'll, we'll probably get back to it when we talk about the multi-core cache management works, which we're not going to cover today. Because with, with multi-core and multi-threading, uh, cache becomes a big shared resource. Uh, yes, uh, somebody helped with fixing. But is it recording right now? <laughs> okay, I was, okay, it wasn't clear. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, yeah, we, we, with multi-threading, uh, cache becomes a shared resource, uh, and uh, it's important to manage it even more efficiently than before, and also there are quality of service issues that come about. Okay, but let's uh, continue where we left off a little bit. This is, uh, so we're not going to cover everything, but these are some of the cache lectures. Actually, there are some other cache lectures. If you're really interested, maybe we'll add that uh, to this list. Uh, in the past, if you have time, you can take a look at them. This is what we discussed last time, handling writes in a cache, whether you have a write-back cache or a write-through cache. This is to jog your memory. We've discussed the trade-offs related to it. Uh, there are other issues with handling writes, so let's uh, go to this. Uh, basically, one question is, what if the processor writes to an entire block over a small amount of time? Is there any need to bring that block from memory into the cache in the first place. So if, you, if you're going to write to the entire block, 64 bytes, that means that you're going to reconstruct the block without ever reading from it, which means that there's no need to fetch the block from the memory in the first place. Right? So the key question is, of course, how do you know that you're going to write to the block? Uh, but this is true for a portion of the subblock also, uh, block also. This is called a subblock. For example, if you're going to write to 4 bytes out of 64 bytes, and if you're not going to read from it, does it make sense to bring those four bytes. And if you're cons doing consecutive writes to four bytes uh, within that 64 bytes, maybe you're going to write to the entire block at some point. So the idea of sectored caches was developed to handle this situation. Basically, people realized that there were many cases in which there were streaming writes into the memory, right to the first four byte of the block, the next four byte, next four byte, next four byte, next four byte, such that you never read from the block, but you're going to reconstruct the block. That's the idea over here. Basically, you divide a block into sub-blocks. It could be four bytes, eight bytes, wh whatever it is of your choice. Usually, it's the same thing as the write granularity, so that you can just write to that location, and not, uh, you don't need to bring the rest of the cache block. And have separate, separate valid and dirty bits for each of the sectors or sub-blocks. So, so sector and sub-block have the same meaning. So as you can see over here, you have a single tag saying, this is my entire 64-byte block. But some of the sub-blocks may be valid and dirty. So you're keeping track of each sub-block separately in terms of valid and dirty bits. But you cannot, uh, you're not changing the cache block size in terms of storage. So you may have, for example, when it, this is useful when you're writing, for example. And there's no need to transfer the entire cache block into the cache. You can just write to one sub-block and then maybe another sub-block and then maybe reconstruct the entire cache block. Right? Or even if you don't re reconstruct the entire cache block, after when this gets evicted, you evict only those sub-blocks that you've written to. Right? That's the idea. So a write simply validates and updates a sub-block. The uh, other upside of this is now you have more freedom in transferring sub-blocks into the cache. A cache block does not need to be in the cache fully. So it gives you some more freedom. So for example, if you are bandwidth limited, you may not bring the entire 64 bytes into your cache, but you bring only some of the sub-blocks into your cache. Of course, this works better if you have a predictor that says, oh, maybe I'm going to touch these sub-blocks within this block. And people have actually devised those predictors. There's a lot of literature uh, on that topic. So you can, you can have a predictor that says, I'm going to touch sub-blocks 157 in this block, so I'll just bring those. This is called spatial footprint prediction. You're really predicting the footprint that you have within a block. And they're interesting, nice papers related to it. OK, so there are, of course, questions which we're not going to cover. How many sub-blocks do you transfer on a read? Uh, what are the conditions under which you, you do this? Uh, that, that, that. Of course, the downside is always more complex design, right? Now we definitely have more bits 
instead of having one valid, one dirty bit per the entire block, we have one each for sub block, but also a management complexity. Uh, we have a management complexity now in terms of decisions, right? When do you bring a block? When do you bring a sub block? When do you write to a sub block directly? Because there's also another, uh, whenever you're writing, you may also later, this may also indicate that you're going to read from it later on, right? So it's, it's actually the, the prediction of when you're going to use a cache line is a bigger question than this. So ideally, you would like to be able to predict, oh, I'm going to need these particular pieces of data and I'm going to fetch only those, right? So that's a predictor. And also, it, it may not exploit spatial locality fully when used for each. If, you're if your predictor is not correct, sometimes you may bring some subblocks, but not the other subblocks, and as a result, you have a problem, right? True for when you do use this for writes. Uh, you may actually write to just a subblock. You, you may decide that, oh, you're doing a four byte write. You're going to validate and dirty only this subblock and not bring the rest of the block from the memory. But then you get a read from the processor that tries to read some other subblock. So you made the wrong choice by not bringing the rest of the block in that case, right? So this gives you more freedom, but now you have to have a good management mechanism to take advantage of that freedom. Yes? But uh, it wouldn't cost you performance if you have to fetch uh, another subblock later. Would it, then? it could potentially, right? Because what happens in memory is these are consecutive in memory. It's a lot easier to fetch consecutive locations at a given time. And if you do that separately, you do it Let's say right now you fetch only eight bytes. And then later you try to fetch eight bytes, you need to open the row, for example, again. So there are implications on the main memory system as, as well. So you may not be as efficient in terms of your fetching. It, it depends also on the row size of the memory. Exactly. It depends on a lot of issues over there. So it may actually be much more costly to fetch it later on. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, OK, basically this freedom comes with responsibility also, as you can see, right? <laughs> You have this nice freedom, but now your management complexity goes up. OK, uh, other questions in caches. I'm going to cover a bunch of questions in caches. Hopefully, we'll be done by the end of the hour, <laughs> but we'll see. So instructions versus data caches. So today, uh, all of these are separate caches. Do you want them separate or unified? Uh, unified, this is actually a very general slide. If you unify two types of caches, the benefit that you get is dynamic sharing of cache space, right? If you statically partition instruction and data, uh, you have a problem uh, because you may over-provision uh, either, right? For example, you have, uh, that, let's say you have total 128 kilobytes of real estate to dedicate to instructions and data caches. Do you divide them in half, 64 kilobytes for instructions, 64 kilobytes for data, or do you have a unified scheme, unified cache? If you divide them in half, and it turns out that you have an instruction working set of only one kilobyte, you're really wasting those 63 kilobytes. And you may have a data working set uh, size of 127 kilobytes, right? Then you, that doesn't fit into the 64 kilobytes you allocated. So this is very fundamental. If you have dynamic partitioning or sharing of space, it's more flexible. Uh, so as a result, unified uh, mechanism, uh, mechanisms can provide you high performance. But the downside, of course, is when you have unified, you have quality of service issues. In this case, if you have a unified cache for instructions and data, uh, if you have a lot of data, it could kick out the instructions from the cache and vice versa. There's no guaranteed space for either. And this may not be good for performance, right? You don't always want, uh, you, you usually, if, if your data actually kicks out instructions, you, you won't be able to feed the pipeline with instructions. Uh, okay, another downside of unified cache is instructions and data are actually accessed in different places in the pipeline, right? We have a long pipeline. There's a fetch state that fetches the instruction, and there's a data fetch stage that fetches the data. Uh, so where do you place this unified cache for access? It has to be somewhere in the middle, perhaps, or you, you make a biased choice. But regardless of whatever choice you make, you penalize because you need to have longer interconnects, right? especially if you have a long pipeline. And today's systems are long pipelines. So because of mainly because of this last reason, actually, <laughs> It's true for uh, the other reasons are also true. Uh, well, this other reason is also true, but mainly because of this reason, first level caches are almost always split. Instruction cache is closer to the fetch unit. Data cache is uh, closer to the data fetch unit. So that you can quickly supply the data with very little interconnect uh, complexity uh, into the instruction engine as well as the data engine. Uh, okay, we're gonna talk about this dynamic versus 
the dynamic sharing versus static partitioning later on when we talk about especially multi-core. Because the same issue arises if you, uh, do you actually uh, have private caches for cores or do you actually share the caches across the cores? And it turns out the ideal choice is somewhere in between. <laughs> having the flexibility of sharing but also having the uh, power to actually provide some privacy. Privacy in the sense that private cache space to each core. And there's a lot of work in that area especially uh, after the rise of the multi-core engines. Okay, but instruction and data caches are usually like this, and usually the second level and afterwards they're shared. So if you have an L2 cache, it's shared between instructions and data. If you have an LT cache, it's shared between instructions and data. Yeah. I said almost always because there are some exceptions to this. There's always some interesting design that has an L2 instruction cache, for example. Especially in server workloads, for example, uh, those tend to have very large instruction working sets. Uh, and as a result, you want to keep the instruction working set uh, in, the, in the chip. You don't want to access instructions all the way from memory. So some of these uh, server machi these machines that are designed for servers actually have large L2 instruction caches. Okay, we'll also talk about this when we come to prefetching because prefetching also plays a role. You can, you can actually make use of a small cache with very good prefetching mechanisms into the cache, right? Okay. Okay, multi-level caching in a pipeline design, now that we're in pipelining. Uh, so pipelining actually dictates this decision, as you see. Uh, but pipelining actually dictates other decisions potentially as well, right? So first, if you look at first level caches, decisions are very much affected by cycle time and how fast you can supply, uh, supply data or instructions. As a result, first level caches are usually smaller, they're lower associativity, and they, uh, they split instruction and data caches, as I said. And uh, they, they uh, have tag store and data store that are accessed in parallel. So you index into the tag store, at the same time you index into the data store, and those two are accessed in parallel. Even if you don't hit in the cache, you'll get some, something out of the data store, but you're gonna not use it, of course, if you don't hit into, if the tag store says you didn't hit into the data, in the cache, right? Why? Because you want to get the data very quickly, because you're supplying it to, directly into the pipeline. You don't want to access the tag store first, wait for the result, hit or miss, and then if it's a hit, access the data store. That actually adds a lot of latency. Uh, but that's not necessarily true for second level caches. Uh, in this case, you need to balance the hit rate and access latency and increasingly energy consumption because these are large. Actually, I say second level caches here because at some point in the past, second level caches was the last level. But think of, uh, take this with a grain of salt, of course. There are second level, third level, maybe fourth levels. Maybe second level cache decisions start resembling more the first level cache decisions as first level caches become more constrained. But these are, think of these as caches that are farther away from the core uh, for pipeline. In that case, uh, this, I mean, that's, it's true that decisions need to balance the hit rate and access latency, and they're usually large and highly associative. Latency is not as important. This doesn't mean that it's not important, but not as important as this one. Right? And if you have such a large cache, let's say 32 megabyte cache, now, it starts making sense uh, to uh, access tag store and data store serially. Why? Because latency is not as important, but power consumption is very important. If you have, a, let's say, a 64-way associative cache, uh, you don't want to power up all of the 64 data ways and pick some of the data if you're going to miss in the cache. Right? And the miss rates of second level or third level or fourth level caches are usually, as we discussed last time, uh, much higher than the first level caches because of locality principle. What happens is you capture most of the locality in the first level caches. Usually the hit rates over there are 90% plus and above. Whereas the miss rate, uh, hit rates at second level, third level, fourth level, they're usually much lower than 90%. 50% is not unreasonable to see actually. Does that make sense? So uh, actually accessing these serially saves a lot of power. Of course it adds latency to the access, yes. So 50% would be like closer to memory than if, the, if you have multiple caches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if you have 50% in a second, then uh, uh, L3 cache will even lower you. That's right, yeah, 50% is definitely closer to, but of course it depends on the workload also, right? Yeah. Sometimes you get 0%, even 0% <laughs> is an exaggeration, but if you're random access, you get 0% in all of the caches. But you're right. I mean, this goes back to that hierarchical latency analysis that we discussed yesterday. If you uh, remember, I put in uh, to, to get the average latency to five cycles, 
uh, I, I put in two different choices. One is really uh, uh, increasing the hit rate in the first double cache, and the second is uh, having a reduced hit rate in the first double cache, but a higher hit rate in the second level cache. So it really depends on the overall latency that you expose to the processor. So 50% may not be that bad if your first, cache, first level cache is doing really well. Because in the end, second level cache doesn't see the same accesses as the first level cache. If, if most of your accesses are hitting in the first level cache, that's good. Only the remaining accesses, maybe 50% miss over here, but that's okay because there are very few accesses. So a good metric in general actually to use is misses per thousand instructions. I, I am actually a big proponent of that metric as opposed to like 1% hit rate or 50% hit rate uh, because that gives you an idea of how much impact cache misses may have on the program. So for example, if your misses per thousand instructions is less than one over here, you're doing pretty well, <laughs> likely. Because that tells you how many cache misses do you encounter over the course of executing thousand instructions, right? Whereas 99% uh, may tell you not much because you may actually memory, uh, lots of memory uh, accesses. Okay, so, uh, so we talked about serial and parallel access of tag and data store. There are trade-offs related to this, but there are also serial versus parallel access of levels as well, right? Uh, you may, for example, decide to start the second level cache access only if the first level misses. That's called serial. You serialize the accesses. Uh, in that case, the second level does not see the same access as the first. Uh, and first level acts as a filter, as we've just discussed. It filters some temporal and spatial locality. And management policies are therefore different between first level and second level because they actually see very different access streams. Now you can also do a parallel access of levels. That's not done as much uh, because now uh, what does that mean? That means whenever you actually start the, let's say, one level access, first level cache access, you also send a request to the second level. If you miss in the first level, this means that you'll get the second level access started much earlier than you would otherwise do if you were doing serial access, right? So that's the advantage. Basically, you're hedging your bets. You're, try, you're, pre, you're, pre, uh, you're, you're guessing that you're going to miss. So of course, these decisions can become much better directed if you have a predictor, right? If you have a predictor that predicts, oh, I'm likely to miss in the cache, then you may actually start the next access much earlier. But of course, all of these add complexity into the system. And this part, this memory part is very complex in a processor. There's a lot of prediction that happens. And we didn't even talk about prefetching. So keep this in mind. There's, there's a lot of design decisions over here. And this, some of this will motivate, oh, why don't we actually look at a different paradigm, like processing close to memory as opposed to designing all these hierarchies. But it's good to know when these hierarchies may be good and may not be good. Uh, and when, when processing close to the memory itself may be good and may not be good. But the, hopefully this gives you an idea of the complexity of the design space. Okay, I think that I'm going to leave this for your review, but I have these slides on cache performance. Like these different cache parameters affect the hit versus miss rate, but I think some of these are relatively obvious and some of these we already discussed, like cache size, trade-offs. I'll let you uh, study these. Does that sound good? I think we covered actually small blocks versus large, large blocks a little bit. And, and we already talked about some of this. Actually, we, we talked about associativity, I think. Okay, that's for your review. <laughs> so let's talk about the classification of cache misses. Uh, there are three kinds of cache misses. Com actually, there are four kinds, but I'm, I'm going to ignore the fourth kind over here. Uh, but fourth kind is communication misses or coherence misses uh, when, when you actually communicate between two different processors. But we're not talking about those yet. Uh, but the first kind is compulsory capacity, a second kind is capacity, and the third kind is conflict. It's interesting to classify these because uh, compulsory misses have a very different behavior, right? This is really the first reference to a block and you don't have it in the cache. That always results in a miss, right? And subsequent references sit unless the cache block is displaced for the reasons below, right? And then we're gonna talk about how to eliminate these different kinds of misses later on. Capacity miss happens because cache is too small to hold everything needed, right? Uh, but the, there's a definition here. What does it mean to be too small, right? What if you have a direct map cache and you miss because you have A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B uh, alternating accesses uh, to those two addresses? That's really not a capacity miss uh, because if you actually kept the same capacity in terms of the data store and increase your associativity, you could eliminate that miss. So that's why it's, that is a conflict miss, that ABAB that I just mentioned. Capacity miss is defined as the misses that would occur 
even in a fully associative cache with optimal replacement, okay, uh, of the same capacity. <laughs> now there's a danger over here, of course, right? This may be very fuzzy. This depends on what you're optimizing for, but at least fully associative cache with some reasonable uh, replacement policy. So it's a bit fuzzy actually, because you can always do better management of your, full of your cache space and eliminate some misses, right? Okay, assuming that we define this nicely, the rest is basically capacity, uh, conflict misses. Any miss that is neither a compulsory miss nor a capacity miss. So why is this important to distinguish? Because there are different ways of handling each miss type. Uh, compulsory misses, for example, actually caching cannot help with these, right? Actually, pure caching. Because pure caching says, after you access a block or an element, you put it into the cache. By definition, compulsory means this is the first access. Right? So you cannot eliminate these caching, but you can anticipate what block you're going to need into the future and bring that block into the cache before you even access it the first time. Right? So that's prefetching, that's the idea of prefetching. And prefetching works well if your access patterns are regular. For example, if you're accessing address uh, uh, 048, cache block addresses 0, 4, 8, 12, 16. Now you have a stride of four cache blocks. And yes, uh, once you recognize that pattern, you can prefetch those cache blocks into your cache before you even uh, touch any of those cache blocks right, uh, from the processor. So compulsive misses are eliminated by prefetching. <laughs> Conflict misses, more associativity. We've seen the uh, solution to this before. Or other ways to get more associativity without making the cache more associative, because we know the downsides of, uh, or complexity associated with associativity. Can we actually get the benefits of associativity without actually adding the hardware to support that associativity? We're gonna talk about that. Uh, and we're gonna talk about some of these issues, like uh, some of these ideas actually. And capacity misses, utilizing cache space better. <laughs> Keep blocks that will be referenced, for example having a much better intelligent policy to predict the reuse behavior of the cache blocks and basically maybe not even caching some of the cache blocks that you're not going to use. Right. And also I think capacity can, uh, this is also, uh, I think software management is a special case of utilizing this cache space better. Uh, you can actually uh, make use of your capacity much better by, for example, uh, uh, more intelligently use, uh, uh, dividing your working set and computation such that each computation phase's data fits into the cache, right? So as opposed to working with a huge mat matrix and bringing a row, let's, let's assume you're doing matrix multiplication, and each row and column, basically you're multiplying, right? You're taking a dot product of that. Let's assume even a row is greater than your cache. It makes no sense to actually multiply bring that row and multiply it with the column and go to the next row and next column. Because if you do that, your cache is essentially useless. It makes much more sense to actually divide your matrix multiplication in a manner such that you turn it into smaller blocks and each block fits in the cache comfortably and you do the multiplication in those blocks and then maximize util utilization of those blocks while they're in the cache. That's the idea, this is called cache block, uh, blocking or tiling, that's a, that's a very general optimization. It's very much used, for, used in these matrix type of codes. But it's a very simple idea as you can see, right? And people use this to improve the performance of their code. And we may actually later see something related to this. Does that make sense? Hopefully that's clear. How many of you have worked with blocked codes? Like tile, cache tiling, cache blocking? Okay, some people have. So you know the importance of it, I assume. It makes a huge difference, basically. You go, you, I mean, if, you, in, in the, if, you're, if you're dealing with large matrices, you get from 0% hit rate to 100% hit rate, basically, if, you're, if you do it well. And this is very well known. Actually, compilers uh, are able to do this, uh, assuming the array, arrays are statically uh, determined and you, you have enough information about the access pattern at the compiler level. But of course, in the general case, how do you do it with especially irregular accesses? Uh, that's a different thing. Okay, so we're gonna cover uh, how to improve cache performance a little bit. Uh, and actually that has been the subject of many uh, papers over the course of, I don't know, more than 50 years. Uh, there are three fundamental goals. So reducing the miss rate, reducing the miss latency or miss cost, and reducing the hit latency or hit cost. And unfortunately some of these go against each other. 
Basically, reducing miss rate can reduce performance if you actually lead to more costly to refetch blocks, right, as we've discussed yesterday. Reducing the miss, I mean, these are good, of course, but the three above, uh, uh, the, these three things above together affect the performance. Uh, okay, I don't know what happened here. Did I go back somehow? Okay, that's interesting. Okay, this is better. <laughs> There's some redundancy over here. So that's one thing that you should not do in your cache. Cache the same things again and again. <laughs> so people actually propose deduplicated caches also. So if the content of the cache blocks are the same, maybe you, have, you, you actually keep only one copy of the cache block and have pointers from different addresses to that particular cache block. Basically, don't duplicate the content. If you have lots of zero blocks in your cache, store only one block that has zeros and basically point every other address to that location. That's essentially what we have over here. For some reason, we have duplication. <laughs> okay, so this is what we're going to cover, hopefully fast, but reducing the miss rate, we're going to talk about some alternatives uh, to associativity, a little bit better replacement and insertion policies, and very briefly, software approaches also. And reducing miss latency and cost, we've talked about some of these. Critical word first, I didn't talk about, but this basically says, uh, Whenever you're bringing a cache block from main memory into the cache or next level to this level of a cache, bring the critical word first. This makes a special sense if you have a miss in the L1 cache and the processor needs some part of the uh, block. You can think of one sub block is more important because that load requests that sub block. And usually memory systems are designed such that that critical word is brought first into the, into the cache as well as the processor. Now, of course, you may have multiple critical words, right? Because with existing engines, we have multiple instructions per cycle that are generating requests. So how do you deal with that? Now, this also adds complexity into the system. But I have a slide over uh, in the previous part that I skipped that talks about critical word first, but it's very intuitive. Okay, and then we're gonna talk about some of these things over here. Okay, so uh, having a fully associative cache, as I said, is expensive, it's complex, especially in the old times, it was much more complex. So people actually spent a lot of time to reduce the conflict misses without actually making the cache associative. And we'll talk about some of the ideas. We'll start with the victim cache idea. This is actually one of the seminal papers that talks about how to improve memory system performance uh, by Norm Juppie. And uh, it also talks about system, uh, stream prefetchers, which we're going to cover later. But basically the idea is very simple. Don't make the cache associative. Keep it as direct map because it has nice benefits. But handle these conflict misses with a small, more associative structure that you can design to be simpler uh, and uh, called a victim cache and basically supply uh, those conflict misses from there. So for example, direct map cache cannot handle the access pattern A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B to the same set, right? So if you have that access pattern over here, A will stay here and B will stay here, right? That's the idea. If you have the access pattern A, B, C, D, E in a direct map cache, a will stay here, B, C, D, E will hopefully stay here if you have enough, enough space in the victim cache. That's the idea. Now, why does this make sense? Because in most cases, you don't, uh, I mean, the observation in this paper was that uh, you don't have a lot of sets that show this behavior. There are some sets that show this thrashing behavior and th that thrash thrashing behavior can be supplied from a small fully associated buffer. That's the idea. So it can avoid ping-ponging of cache blocks mapped to the same set, and we discussed that. Of course, now there's a management complexity that you add. You add another level into the system. Now it's, it's could increase miss latency. Now the upside is that uh, there, there are design choices here, of course, right? Uh, do you actually access this, uh, the L1 cache uh, in parallel with the victim cache, or do you do it serially, right? If you do it serially, maybe you can put a lot, uh, you can increase the space, the size of this more, right? It's kind of like a, L1.5 level cache. If you do it in parallel, then it's, it's still the same level as L1, but now if you do it in parallel, your access latency uh, is dictated by the maximum of this cache and the victim cache. Right? So they're clearly design choices, and you cannot make the victim cache as big because as we discussed, the pipeline needs the data and there's a frequency requirement that you're trying to probably satisfy, uh, and you cannot make the victim cache uh, as big as what you could make if you put it over here. So clearly this adds complexity, but this has actually been employed in many processors. Uh, 
It could be done at the L1 level, as you can see. It could be done at the next level. So it's essentially an auxiliary cache that helps the main cache store. Make sense? Yeah? OK. You can, for example, in your data cache assignment, you can actually add a victim cache in the, uh, in the uh, what is this? Uh, it's escaping me. Extra credit part, yes. <laughs> In the extra credit part, you have a lot of freedom to explore, basically. And I think adding a victim cache is very instructive. Of course, the effectiveness of the victim cache, uh, I think it's a bit debatable at this point in time. This was a very good idea, circa 1990s. Today, uh, it depends on how you design things right. Uh, maybe at the first level cache level, it's still effective. It's not clear if it's as effective in the second level cache. It also depends on how big you can make this right. And with the it also depends on your workload behavior, clearly, uh, because if you also trash your victim cache, you have a problem, right? Then this is useless access. Uh, so you may actually, a, a two-way uh, cache may be a, bit, a better design choice than a victim cache. But you can always add a victim cache to a two-way cache as well, right? Because there's no end to this, to this conflict, conflict behavior unless you make the cache fully associative. Okay. So of course, uh, I'd say over here, uh, victim cache is a fully associated buffer, but that's how it was proposed in this paper. But it can, of course, not, it doesn't have to be a fully associated buffer, right? It could be a highly associated buffer, I don't know, maybe 32-way, and you could have more things over here than 32. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a big design space over here as well. Okay, that's one idea. Let's talk about some other idea. Uh, another idea is better utilizing your cache space. This is called hashing. You can have a direct map cache, why are you getting this conflict behavior, A, B, A, B, A, B? You may realize that because you're using the same index bits, right? So why not have a mapping function from the index bits in the physical address or virtual address, depending on how you address things, address to cache. Take that index bits, go through a randomizing hash function, randomizing but, uh, of course, consistent, deterministic across time, and now you distribute your indices across the entire space in your direct map cache. That's the idea, randomization basically. Better utilize that cache space. And people have figured out that if you use the uh, address bits directly, you get not so good uh, distribution of uh, accesses to your sets. Okay, so hopefully this is clear. This makes uh, a lot of sense, right? So example conflicting addresses. Strided access pattern where the stride equals uh, the number of sets in the cache. That's actually a very pathological access pattern, right? So you have a direct map cache, you have 512 blocks, and your stride is 512. You're always hitting the same set, set zero. Right. If you have a randomizing function, that's nice. <laughs> right. OK, of course, this is more complex to implement, and it can lengthen the critical path, right? Because now you're taking the address, going through a randomizing hash function. It depends on the complexity of hash, uh, that hash function, how long, uh, how much you increase the access latency to the cache. If you can do it within the same number of cycles that you did before, that's great. But of course, if you want a better randomizing hash function, that becomes more complex, and then it can increase your critical path. OK, so that's one idea that's actually used in systems. Uh, another idea, this is called poor man's associative cache. Uh, I like this idea. But if you think about, this is basically uh, associativity in space versus time. Space-time uh, duality is very interesting, I think, in general. But I think in this case, it's a very perfect example. The idea is very simple. Uh, uh, if you look at uh, the pictures that I showed yesterday, uh, we, had we added associativity in space, right? We had this uh, one column that had eight blocks, eight sets. And then we turned into two columns, each of which had four sets. And then we turned into four columns, each of which had two sets. And then we turned into one uh, eight columns, each of which had a single set. That's the fully associative. Basically, you have the same number of blocks, but you're turning it into associativity by managing the space. Right? With the same set, you have more things to put. The same idea can be applied to time. You have the same number of blocks, zero through eight. What you do is, the first time, you index into the first, uh, let's say, uh, one of the indices. Check if the, access, if the cache block that you're looking for is there. If it's not there, go to the next index. If it's not there, go to the next index in the next cycle. 
If it's not there, go to the next index in the next cycle. Basically, as opposed to changing the structure of the cache and providing associativity in space, you change the indexing function over time. And now a block can go into multiple locations, potentially, multiple different sets. But your structure is still direct mapped. Does that make sense? So that's very, that's very simple, I think, the space-time complexity. If it's going to miss, use a different index function and access the cache again. And now you can make the cache fully associative, right? You can, you can basically all uh, go through it sequentially. You check index 0 first, index 1 next, index 2 next, index 3 next, and then use all of your space. But you can also make it two-way associative. You can also make it four-way associative. You can make it eight-way associative, basically, by doing this. And I'm not going to go through this because it's simple. This basically says how, how you do the indexing function without randomization. Of course, once you, once you combine these ideas, you need to be more careful. OK, but this is actually used also in past caches. Like you can, you can go into one more location, for example, or two more, three more locations. So this gives you more freedom. And your cache, cache stays simple. Of course, the downside is your access latency increases right, a lot. The upside, this is poor man's associative cache because you don't have space. <laughs> You're poor, uh, but you can tolerate potentially latency, right? Now, instead of uh, with, a, with, a, with a nicely real associative cache, as opposed to pseudo associative cache, with a real associative cache, you get, the, you get both of the blocks at the same time and you pick the one that matches. Here, you may actually do multiple accesses to the cache. Okay, and at some point it may not make sense Right? Because if you're doing 128 accesses to the cache, to, to hit in the cache, maybe it's better to go the memory rate. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's what we just discussed. Uh, okay, there are other ideas that are really interesting. Uh, Andres Seznik, who is in Inria, has been actually working on uh, interesting ideas in caches. A lot of them made, made their way into the processors. Uh, but this is one other idea. Uh, basically, this is hashing, essentially, uh, for uh, 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 associative caches, basically. I'll, I'll uh, demonstrate that. Basically, you reduce the conflict misses by using different index functions for each cache way. You actually increase the randomization even more. That's the idea. Very simple. Existing caches employ same index function for each way. And this can lead to some not so desirable patterns, especially with striding accesses. But if you actually use something like this, different index functions for different ways, you actually increase the randomization that you get. And you, get, you, you basically reduce these not, not so nice patterns that cause conflict misses. So in general, basically, as you can see, this idea is very similar to caching, but you're applying it to different ways. Uh, hashing, sorry. OK, we said this. Basically, the benefit indices are more randomized. Uh, memory blocks are better distributed across the sets. And this is less likely that two blocks have the same index. Yes? Uh, well, way is basically, uh, this is uh, way z uh, so uh, this is a set. Ah, this is yeah, and then, you yeah, exactly. Okay. And this is a two-way associative cache, basically. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, OK. OK, good. Uh, yeah, I already said this. Of course, now the cost is additional latency of hash function, very similar to what we discussed earlier. And if you want to do this really well, maybe you, you want different index functions for different ways. OK. I mean, there are, there's a lot more that I can discuss, but I gave you the, some basic uh, ideas over here. Now I can exercise your thinking. Uh, probably a lot of things that you may think of are already published. But you may also think of things that are not published. But this is a very crowded area, as you can imagine. Uh, OK, let's talk about software approaches a little bit. I've given you the blocking idea, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. And you can also find a lot of information about it. Uh, but let's talk about some of these things. Basically, you can restructure data access patterns to fit uh, the caches better. You can restructure data layout. This is blocking. And there are multiple different ways of doing it. Let's pick this one, restructuring the data layout or data access patterns. So if, you're, if you have a column major uh, um, matrix or vector, let's say, uh, this means that uh, yeah, consecutive rows, uh, the, the x, xi plus 1 comma j follows xij in memory. Right? That's column major. And this is poor code in, that, in this case. Right? If you look at this, what this code is doing is it's accessing xij and then xij plus 1, xij plus 2, even though those are far away from each other. Make sense? So you need to know how your data is layout, uh, laid out. 
so that you don't write poor code like this. So you can easily fix this code clearly by reordering, uh, doing the loop interchange. This is called loop interchange uh, optimization. Now you're, uh, it's nice because you're traversing columns first because it's column major. So x i comma j, i plus one comma j dot dot dot. Okay. Hopefully this is clear, right? Basically, you bring into the, you touch cache blocks, you, you touch data that are close together in memory as opposed to far away from each other. And other optimizations also increase hit rates. There are many optimizations like fusing loops. If one loop touches uh, uh, the same data as another loop, you may want to fuse them together and then do something else after that, right? Of course, this requires analysis of the code. It may not be as simple as this. Usually, Matrix code are, are simple, so that uh, these things are relatively easier to do if you know the array bounds, for example, the array sizes. Now, this may not make sense to do if you have a very small matrix, because everything is going to be in the cache anyway, so it may not be worthwhile. There might be other considerations here, like instruction scheduling. So you need to know your array sizes and array bounds, but it's, these are easy to do if you know those, that information in compilers. So, okay, if you have multiple arrays and unknown array sizes at compile time, this becomes much harder. And if you have another application learning, then you have another problem, of course, right? But we'll talk about that later. Uh, because you may all do, do these optimizations, that's good, but you may not get a lot of performance if your cache is not protected uh, from some other application. Okay, blocking, we've discussed this very quickly. Again, divide the loops operating on arrays into computation chunks such that each chunk uh, can hold its data in the cache. This avoids conflicts between different chunks of computation. You can think of it that way. Essentially, divide the working set such that each piece of the working set fits in the cache. But of course, there are other issues that you may need to think about if you, uh, depending on the access patterns. There can be conflict uh, within a block. There can be conflicts among different arrays. And array size may be unknown at compiler programming time, and that makes blocking a bit harder. Okay, restructuring data layout. Let's talk about this. I like this example uh, a lot. Let's, uh, uh, we're not looking at arrays right now, but we have this uh, linked list. Basically, the linked list contains these nodes, let's say a record of students, and we want to search something in that linked list. Let's say it's a huge linked list. Assume a huge linked list with one billion nodes, one billion students, a bit bigger than ETH probably. Uh, and we want to search something. So the key question is, well, this code actually has terrible performance. It has 0% hit rate, and the question is why? Any guesses? Basically, what we're doing is we have these linked list of nodes, and we're going from one node to another, 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 until we find this input key. And we're just checking uh, the key of the node. Yes? The name and the school are relevant, so... Yes, exactly. And keys in there. Exactly. Yeah. Basically, what's happening is, if you look at this node, assuming this is consecutively laid out, which is the case in most <laughs> systems, uh, basically, what, uh, you have this 256 byte plus 256 byte arrays, that's 512 bytes, and let's assume that this is 4 bytes, and let's assume that this is 8 bytes. So you have these 12 bytes over here followed by 512 bytes in your node. So the size of this node is 524, and that's bigger than your cache block size because somehow it tends to be 64 bytes as we've discussed, right? Which means that whenever you're doing this traversal, every time you go into a different node, you get a cache miss. But if you actually restructured your, yeah, that's what we said basically. But if you restructured your code at the high level, this way, and traversed these, and only when you found the key, you went into this other data structure that contains a huge amount of data, then you would actually get locality over here because now nodes are consecutively laid out in memory. When you touch one node, when you get to the next node, hopefully, or your, your hit rate, you're packing the nodes much better into your cache. Right? You'll hopefully get to exploit some locality. Of course, that really depends on how the linked list is also constructed. Right? Whether you're going from one node to the next node with locality, but the probability that you'll get better performance with this is much higher. So, okay, who should do that? Basically, the key idea, high-level idea, is separate frequently used fields of a data structure and pack them into a separate data structure. Right? And access those frequently used uh, fields uh, through in your traversals. Who should do this? There are many questions here. Programmer. Of course, if you do it at, as a programmer level, that's the best place, I think. Compiler may be able to do it. How does it figure out the uh, frequently used parts? 
you need to profile probably, or you need to, uh, static profiling may not always work, but dynamic profiling may work. Hardware, can the hardware do? Maybe hardware realizes that parts of these things are used and not used, and then packs them dynamically, right, together. Now that's a more complex caching mechanism, but that's doable also with some complexity. I think it also boils down to we can determine what is frequently used. I think programmer, if they have good insight into the program, in this case, of course, it's simple. But in, in some other case, it may not be as simple, right? OK, so this gives you an example of the importance of caching, right? Uh, I think it's, it's also important to take advantage of caching. I, I've seen many codes that look like this, actually, in real life, <laughs> even in companies that do software engineering very often. It happens, basically, because people are writing code and they're not thinking what performance they would get. They're actually really interesting stories, but if we start telling those stories, we don't have time. Maybe we'll discuss them in some other lecture <laughs> when we're not being recorded. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so this is, gives you some idea. Uh, there are other software approaches also. There are many uh, approaches, like cache-conscious data structures, uh, cache-conscious data layouts. There are very interesting papers that were written in compilers areas, PLDI 1999, Trishul Chalimbi. Uh, maybe we can put that, uh, ex put that on the website. Uh, but I'm not going to cover a lot of these. There's, there's no way. OK, let's take a look at this other part, reducing missed latency and cost that's been examined a little bit less, if you will, especially the cost part. Latency, yes, people care about, but cost, cost of a cash miss, people have not been as cognizant about that for a long time. Uh, and there are better replacement and insertion policies, which we kind of discussed. Uh, Non-blocking cash we're going to discuss, and multiple access per cycle we're going to discuss. But let's, let's focus on cost a little bit. What is missed latency or missed cost affected by? This is affected by where the miss gets serviced from, but you can ask the question, where does the miss get serviced from? And also, this is also affected by how much does the miss stall the processor, right? These are two different things. Uh, they, are, they may be related, but they're really different. So where does the miss get serviced from? There may, may be many questions to it, right? If you're in a NUMA, non-uniform memory access system, you may have a local memory and a remote memory. Some part of memory could be far, and uh, some part of memory could be close, and that makes a big difference. What level of the cache in the hierarchy does the miss get serviced from? That makes a big difference. Row hit versus row miss in DRAM. We discussed that. That makes a big difference. Queuing delays in the memory control and the interconnect. So the point of time you generate the miss actually make, can make a big difference. There are many other effects. Let's look at the second one. How much does the miss stall the processor? So you may have a miss, but it may not matter because its latency is overlapped by some other miss that takes longer. And that other miss is actually stalling the processor right now because that miss is needed by the instruction that's really at the head of the pro uh, processor's reorder buffer. Right? So some misses, not all misses are created equal, basically, also. And this is a relatively new realization, and I'd like to talk about that. So basically, is the data immediately needed? That's also another question. And this also becomes even more interesting if you start adding other types of requests. Right? Is there read miss? Is there write miss? Is it a prefetch miss? Now, not, not all of those are equal also, right? But sometimes a prefetch miss may be more important than a read miss, because read miss latency is overlapped by some other read miss. But if you actually prefetch this, you get rid of some other miss later into the future. So it's not a, it's not a very simple prioritization mechanism. Like, you always prioritize the read misses over prefetches. That doesn't work, actually. We worked on this quite a bit. Uh, you really need to be a little bit more intelligent than that. Because sometimes you want to prioritize prefetches over uh, uh, read misses. And also, I mean, another example of this is if your row buffer is open in DRAM, and if you have a prefetcher that has request to that row buffer, and if you have a read miss to some other row, it may actually make sense to service that prefetch from that row buffer quickly before you service the read miss. That's another area where you may want to pre prioritize prefetches or read misses. OK, so let's talk about this. Uh, I really like this topic. It's related to my PhD thesis also. But <laughs> I think there is a lot, of, a lot of things to be done over here. Uh, okay, so basically memory level parallelism is, is uh, gen uh, the idea of generating and servicing multiple memory accesses in parallel. And actually the term was introduced by a single page paper that was written by Andy Glue in, in Wild and Crazy Ideas session in Asplos in 1998. I would definitely recommend that paper to you guys. We should actually put it up also on the website. Uh, basically there are two types of misses. One type of miss is this isolated miss uh, and the other type of miss is this parallel miss. Uh, parallel miss means that the latencies of the misses are overlapped, essentially. There are several techniques to improve MLP. We're going to talk about that later on. Auto-word execution was, is one example, right? 
you, uh, you can actually uh, keep executing instructions until your window is full and uh, you may actually generate multiple misses in parallel and their latencies are overlapped assuming they're serviced in parallel in different uh, uh, parts of the memory hierarchy. But isolated miss, you generate one miss, you stall until uh, you get the data for that miss and there are no other misses that are happening in between. So MLP, this memory levels and parallelism actually vary. Some misses are isolated and some are parallel. So how does this affect cache replacement? That's the question we asked circa 2005 or so. So if you look at traditional cache replacement policies, they try to reduce miscount in general. An implicit assumption is that reducing miscount reduces this memory related stall time. It's good for uh, uh, reducing the stall of the processor. But actually this cost, misses that have different cost or different memory level parallelism breaks this assumption. Eliminating an isolated miss actually is much more important that helps performance more than eliminating this, uh, a parallel miss. And I'm going to give you examples of this. And eliminating a higher latency miss could help performance more than eliminating a lower latency miss as well, how fast the miss is serviced. So we're not going to tackle this, but if you generalize the idea, you should be actually more cognizant of this. So let me give you an example. I'm not going to give you the, how we actually implement this because that's the paper that you may read. So this is one example cooked up but this can happen. Assume that you have a cache that has a four-way associativity and four blocks, one set, simple. And assume that uh, we have this uh, access pattern. It's a loop and we cooked it up. As you can see, these are uh, misses that occur in parallel. The processor generates these requests together and they go to the memory hierarchy, they occur in parallel. And the processor accesses the same, these parallel blocks again and then these are misses, uh, blocks that are accessed serially. They're isolated. So we're going to look at two replacement algorithms. One is Bellity is optimal. That's optimal for minimizing the miss rate, which is good. And the second is MLP aware. That's trying to reduce the isolated misses as much as possible. So we're going to look at a fully associated cache containing four blocks. Let's start from here. I mean, you can repeat the analysis later on to see that that's a good place to start. But basically, uh, after this point, uh, uh, with build is optimal, you would cache these requests in the cache, right? So you would cache these four blocks in the cache. Okay, yeah, that's what I wanted. At this point, this is the state of the cache. P1 is the highest priority, P4 is the lowest priority because that's the first one touched and brought into the cache. The cache looks like this, which means that after these parallel accesses, you get four hits over here. You move over here, what the build is optimal does is replaces P1 with S1. Why? Because P1 is the one that's going to be referenced furthest into the future. And well, these optimal is trying to minimize the miss rate, so you want to replace uh, the lowest priority thing with, uh, yeah, and the lowest priority thing is P1 at that point. Okay, and then we go over here. Now uh, we have S1 over here. Now what we do is replace S1 with S2. Why? Because the, the thing that's going to be furthest referenced into the future is going to be S1. If you look over here, we magically figured that out. That's spelled is optimal. And we get a miss clearly. And then at this point, we replace S2 with S3 because the thing that's going to be referenced furthest into the future is S3, S3 uh, S2, sorry. And that's the state of the cache. So what we've gotten at the end, oh, okay. And then of course we come back and this is the state of the cache. So we're going to get three hits over here and uh, one of them is going to miss. So P1 is not in the cache uh, at that point. And in the steady state, this is what you get in, in the execution of this loop. You get one stall because of this miss. Oh, this is messed up, sorry. <laughs> so you need to, I, I couldn't figure out an easy way of fixing it, but this, is, this stall belongs to here. This stall belongs to this miss. This stall belongs to this miss. This stall belongs to this miss. So you stall four times for four misses. Right? That's the idea. These are all hits, so there's no stall over here that this thing belongs to there. <laughs> Makes sense, right? We just simulated Baldi's optimal replacement with an X access pattern. Now, what if we were aware that these misses were much more costly than these misses? And that's true, right? Because what's happening is, if you get four misses over here, what will happen is that you're going to stall only approximately once because they're going to be serviced in parallel. That's the assumption we're making. So if you make that assumption, what will be the state of the cache? So at this point, basically we're, we're going to prioritize S1, S2, S3 because we know that they're isolated. So we're going to keep them in the cache. And the state of the cache at this point will be P4, S1, S2, S3. 
That's why we start from there. So you'll get hits on these blocks. And let's see what happens over here. Yeah, P4, that will hit. Everything else will miss. That's fine. And then you replace P4 with P1. And you want to keep S1, uh, keep S1, S2, S3 in the cache because they're serial. They're more costly. And when you get here, you'll get three misses again. And this is what happened. We have three misses belonging to this chunk, but they're serviced in mostly in parallel. We have three misses <coughs> belonging to this chunk. They're serviced mostly in parallel. We have six misses in total, greater than this. But we're stalling only for twice. Right, twice plus some change. <laughs> change in the sense that, because they're not maybe perfectly parallelized, right? That's the idea, basically. And as you can see, you say, we save cycles. So this shows that, I mean, this does two things. Well, these optimal is not optimal for uh, minimizing execution time. That's clear. But also, it shows that you can increase the miss rate and still get better performance by taking into account how, how costly each miss is for you. Yes? Are you, in this case, not storing the ones that you get in parallel in the cache? That's right, exactly. That's the idea, basically. The idea is you know the cost of the misses. These are serial, so you try to prioritize them and keep them in the cache, whereas these are less costly, so you can actually kick, kick them out from the cache. We only have basically one P in the cache. Exactly, yes. Yeah, exactly. If you go back over here, you have only one P and you have the three S's. Yeah. Okay, so that's the idea, basically. And I think this is a very nice insight. You can actually read the paper. It's going to be a review paper. How do you do that? Of course, there's a lot of complexity that gets into this because this is not the only consideration in caching, right? Reuse is also very strong. You need to also take into account reuse. You cannot just take into account cost. How do you take into account both of the metrics in making a decision? And it turns out there is no single, at least we couldn't come up with a, very, a single equation that makes both of them nice. So we actually went on to develop a hybrid replacement policy that basically picks between two different policies. OK, uh, there are also other works that I'm not going to cover in this course, but uh, Moin Croatia has done a lot of work on high performance caching, different insertion policies. And we have some work on evicted address filter and compression. If we have time, we're going to cover that. So there's also, so this is actually interesting. So, so this work is trying to uh, reduce the impact of cache thrashing. Uh, the idea is basically uh, ha have a probabilistic policy to insert into the cache such that if you actually have a larger working set, some of the working set actually stays in the cache. Right? They realize that if you're scanning through a lot of data, your reuse behavior is not good, but you're touching some working set at some point, so you keep that working set inside the cache. And by being probabilistic, you can do that. Uh, Vivek has done some work on uh, also this, but we're not going to talk about that right now. I'd recommend that you take a look at it. And uh, another way of actually making better use of your cache space is compression. Right? I kind of alluded to this when we talked about deduplication. I think of deduplication as a special form of compression. Uh, based on the content, you actually reduce the amount of things you store, but you can also compress the data and get more of, out of your cache. And I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done uh, in this area going forward. OK, let's see how, what time it is right now. OK, maybe we should take a break here, and then we'll continue with more caching. Let's take a 10-minute break. OK, let's get started. Uh, so I mentioned hybrid cache replacement. I'm going to spend just, just a little bit of time to talk about this, but because this is one of the relatively new topics uh, in, in cache design, other than multi-core, which we'll cover later. But basically, the problem is not a single policy provides the highest performance, clearly, as we've discussed. And this is true for the global cache, but also it's true for every, any given set as well. For some sets, you may have a different behavior. And then for other sets, if you're thrashing, for example, random access, uh, random replacement may be much better than LRU, right, as we've discussed. Uh, so the idea is very simple. Implement both policies and pick the one that's expected to perform best at runtime. Right? It's very similar to hybrid branch predictors that we've discussed uh, earlier in digital circuits, which we may discuss more in this lecture. You could do this on a per set basis which, of course, increase your complexity. Or you could do this for the entire cache. The upside is higher performance, usually. Of course, the downside is higher cost and complexity. And you need a selection mechanism. You need a decision mechanism as to which policy you should follow. Right? 
you, you definitely need to implement both policies, which the cost comes from there, but also in the selection mechanism that says which policy you should follow either on a per set basis or a per region basis or per, for the entire cache. So a key question is how do you determine the best policy? One obvious answer is implement multiple tax stores, each following a particular policy. Essentially, you're emulating what would have happened if you were actually following that policy and find the best policy and have the main tax store follow that best policy. Does that make sense? That's simple. One of them following LRU, the other one is following random and pick the best one. So this uh, little bit of terminology because I'm going to use some slides uh, that use this terminology. Tag store is also called a tag directory. If you hear this term, don't get confused. Basically some people call it tag directory. Uh, directory means something else as we will discuss in coherence. So I don't like the directory term as much, but that's how it is. Uh, tag store, uh, basically main tag store is a tag store that is actually used to keep track of the block addresses that are present in the cache at this moment. And you also have auxiliary tag store, imaginary tag store, if you will. Uh, this is the tag store that is used to emulate a policy X. And you could actually expand, extend this idea to multiple policies clearly, right? You could be emulating five different policies and picking one. This is not used for tracking the block addresses that are present in the cache. You use the main tag store for that. Uh, this is used for tracking what the block addresses in the cache would have been if the cache were following policy X. Right? That's the idea. So okay, let's take a look at, the, so you're gonna read this paper, so I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. Basically, uh, this paper, other than introducing the fact that you should actually take into account MLP and cache replacement decisions, this also proposed an implementable way of doing hybrid cache replacement. Uh, so basically, you can think of uh, the main tag directory, like this, main tag store. You have one for set A, and you have auxiliary tag directories, auxiliary tag stores, for policy one and policy two, LRU and random, let's say. And for each set, you basically have a counter that decides which one you should be following. Right. And you have a policy to increment and decrement these counters. This is, what's, this is a policy that's used in this paper. Basically, uh, if one policy is doing the same as the other policy, you don't change the counter. If one policy is doing better than the other policy, you basically uh, bias the counter with, in some way for that particular policy that's doing better. Right. And in this case, we bias the counter using the cost of a miss as the metric, right? And if one policy is doing better than the other policy, then clearly the counter is biased one way or the other, right? And this is one example of decision you can make. If the most significant width of this counter is one, then uh, in the main cache, main tag directory, we use policy one, otherwise we use policy two, right? That's a simple way. But there are many design options, of course, here. So how do you actually do this? Uh, do you want to do this across all of the sets? One way of doing it is basically per each set. Each set you have a counter. You have two uh, tag directories for each set. That's a lot of cost actually. Counters are actually a lot. Every time you do something, do you, do you really want to do that? That's a possibility, especially if the, each set has a very different behavior. But remember, we actually, most of the caches today try to distribute the accesses across the sets. So you, minimize, you try to minimize the set thrashing behavior that you see. So maybe it doesn't make sense to actually have a counter on a per set basis. Maybe you have a counter for the entire cache. Right? So now you have this auxiliary tag directory for policy one and policy two for all of the sets in the cache. And you have a single counter that's being updated by all of them. And that single counter determines what all of the sets in the cache should follow in terms of the replacement policy. Okay, yes. But if, uh if you at some point decide to switch, then you still only have one cache, right, where you actually have data. So that's right. Wouldn't then your simulation basically be skewed? Yeah, it's possible, certainly. So this may actually uh, not necessarily uh, be perfectly emulating, right? You may actually lose some information. You're right. That's absolutely true. That's not related to the counters, though. That's, that could happen even if you have counters per set. In that case, your selection will be skewed based on, on a set basis, but now you have a global yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, very good point. So of course, even, uh, that is true, but you will see that empirical results are not bad, <laughs> but they're not perfect. I mean, optimal results are, of course, better. So even with the lack of these counters, if you, if you actually do it on a per set basis, you will see that there's a footnote somewhere in this paper that says we're losing about 2.5 or 3% performance because we're actually reducing the counters uh, to one as opposed to the number of sets. 
But even this is not that nice because tax store is actually a lot, right? That's a, that's a huge thing. You don't want to replicate the tax stores uh, and have three tax stores. So one other option is basically uh, do set sampling. And this is an idea that's used in existing systems for other purposes also. But basically, as opposed to implementing multiple tax stores in full for the entire cache, you sample some sets, let's say randomly. This paper does it randomly. Uh, so you, you have auxiliary tag directories only for a few sets. Now you reduce the cost. Uh, these are called the leader sets. Uh, and uh, they update the counter. And all of the follower sets follow uh, what they, uh, basically what, what is good for these sets, what policy is good for these sets. Of course, the, the question is how many sets are required to choose the best performing policy. There's interesting detail in the paper that has some analytical model. And it shows that you, you, with the 32 leader sets, you're good enough, basically. Uh, because you, you, you actually reduce the cost a lot if you have only 32 because last double cache has, let's say, 16,000, 32,000, 64,000 sets. Okay. Uh, and also, the overhead can be further reduced uh, because you really don't need these three things, right? You can actually have one, uh, the main tag directory could be following one of the policies and you switch the main tag directory. Uh, so basically, you can further reduce this by using main tag directory to always simulate one of the policies. So okay, that's the idea basically. So you have these leader sets, set B, E, G, following policy one, let's say, and you have these uh, aug, uh, leader sets also replicated in this policy two, and you have some follower sets. And you decide the policy only for the follower sets this way. Now you reduce the cost, and you can read the paper, the details, uh, the, the, the overhead is very small. And you implemented a hybrid cash replacement policy. These policies can be arbitrary, of course. You could come up with different policies that, are, that go well with each other, that, that complement each other. So this is a very general mechanism. So the paper talks about two different policies. Uh, this is sampling-based adaptive replacement. And this is one uh, linear policy. If you read the paper, you will see that linear policy, uh, what I mentioned earlier, it comes up with an equation that takes into account reuse and cost. It's a linear equation. That's why it's called lin over here. There's a big design space, of course, coming up with a metric. Uh, so what this linear policy does is it basically takes into account cost and reuse in the decisions. And if you look over here, it's good for some workloads. The red bars are higher. But it's actually terrible for some other workloads. So MGrid, for example, has very good locality. This is co the comparison baseline is a cache that implements LRU. Uh, and this is performance improvement. So if you use the sampling-based adaptive replacement, actually you do better. Uh, basically, you get rid of these big negatives with a single policy. Linear policy is still a single policy. With multiple policies and selecting between them in a cost-effective manner, you get rid of these negatives. And you actually amplify some of the positives, as you can see over here. Because at any given time, you select the policy that's doing well as much as possible. Sometimes you lose a little bit, of course, as you can see. Okay. We can read the paper. And this is one example of the adaptation to the phases. So it turns out for this workload, uh, this linear policy is better for a while. But then LRU becomes much better because the beha reference behavior of the workload changes at a relatively fine grain. And you can adapt to that fine granularity change uh, if, you're, if you're doing this uh, sampling-based adaptive replacement. That's the, this is IPC. And you can see that uh, you're tracking the best one as much as possible. And sometimes you're doing better because of synergistic effects. OK, any questions? Well, now you know the hybrid replacement also, which could come in handy at some point. OK, uh, so let's talk about enabling outstanding, multiple outstanding misses. This is another thing that you could do for your uh, cache lab, actually, uh, as an extra credit. You could enable a non-blocking cache that uh, enables multiple cache misses. That basically, the question is, the processor can generate multiple cache accesses. Can the later access be handled while the previous miss is outstanding? And the goal is to enable cache access where there's a pending miss uh, or enable multiple misses in parallel. Uh, I think this is more important. Uh, of course, this is important also while you're servicing a cache miss, you should also serve, be able to service a cache hit as well. But I think this is harder. So you need to enable memory level parallelism. Uh, so the solution that has been proposed is called non-blocking or lockup free caches. And this is a relatively old idea. As you can see, it's almost 40 years. Uh, and it's employed in all processors that support caches today. The idea is very simple, actually. 
you keep track of the status and data of the misses that are being handled in some buffer. That's called a miss buffer, or it has this interesting name, miss status handling registers, or holding registers, people call it differently, MSHRs. But this is actually commonly known actually in the architecture community. If someone says MSHR and you don't know it, then you're not an architect probably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so a cache access checks these MSHRs or miss buffers to see if a miss to the same block is already pending. Basically, what, what do these buffers do? These buffers keep track of which are the accesses that are pending, meaning they missed in the cache, but the cache is currently servicing them in the cache controller. They're out waiting to come back into the cache. So if you have a cache access, you can check the MSHRs to see if a miss is already pending there. If it's pending, then a new request is not generated to the memory hierarchy, of course, right? There's no point in generating the same request again to the lower level of the hierarchy. And if pending and the data needed is available, it's already returned, then you can actually forward the data from this uh, miss status handling registries. That's the idea. It's very simple. It requires buffering of the outstanding missed requests. It requires buffering of the data. I'm not going to go through this in detail. You can read it. Uh, but, but these slides, I think, are for your purpose. What do you need in each entry? Uh, what do you need to keep track of? I think these are very, relatively low-level implementation details. But it's, it should be obvious, basically. What is the, for example, I'll, I'll just talk about this. You need, uh, this is one MSHR entry. It could be valid or invalid. If it's valid, what is the block address that's that's down, uh, that basically missed, is it issued to the memory system? You can, have, you can have actually other control registers over here. And what load or store will this block wake up when it gets serviced? This is one way of doing it. Uh, basically, uh, if, if, if the uh, processor, the pro this is the L1 cache level MSHR, but you need MSHRs at all levels of the cache potentially. Uh, if you want to ma maximize your bandwidth utilization in the system. Uh, if, if the processor missed with a load, what it does is it creates uh, this MSHR entry and it places the load over here because load requires a particular piece of data. Now, the purpose of this is when that data gets back from memory, you set this and you basically go and wake up that load. So there needs to be some interface to the processor such that when the data comes back, the load wakes up and the processor can continue processing. Right? I said this is one way of doing it. Uh, there are other ways, right? Uh, uh, you can certainly retry the load, but you need to uh, usually have a signal that says, oh, the, the data is back, right? It doesn't make sense to keep retrying the load all the time, right? Okay. Okay, on a cache miss, you search the MSHRs for a pending access to the same block. If you find it, you allocate a load store entry in the same MSHR entry. Otherwise, you allocate a new MSHR. And if you don't have a free entry, in this miss buffer, you stall. That's why this is actually important because this affects your memory level parallelism. In the past, processors used to have smaller miss buffers, miss MSHR uh, counts. Now they're increasing because they can generate a lot of misses aggressively. Okay, when a sub block returns from the next level in memory, you check which load and stores are waiting for it and forward the data to the load and store unit. And you deallocate the load store entry in the MSHR entry. So it's very simple and obvious, I think. And you write the sub-block in the cache uh, or inside the MSHR. It, so there's one question, of course. When you collect the entire uh, block or sub-block, when do you write it back into the cache? You need to actually schedule for a port, the right port into the cache, and you need to ensure that that write happens. Yeah. <laughs> and if it's the last, last sub-block that you're waiting the data for, you deallocate the MSHR after the writing the block into the cache. So these are obvious, hopefully. So there are, of course, other questions here. When do you access the MSHRs? Do you access them in parallel with the cache? Or do you access them after the cache is complete, in parallel or serial? Clearly, there is a trade-off here. You don't want the MSHRs to determine your cycle time, I think. As a result, if you can access in parallel without changing your cycle time, that's good. Uh, so it depends. Uh, but the, the key is MSHRs need not be on the critical path of hit requests. That's the key. Because these are things that are dealing with misses, right? Uh, and I'll give this example. Which one below is the common case? Cache hit or cache miss and MSHR hit? Of course, you can cook, cook up workloads where the first one is the common case. But usually, the second one is the common case, especially at the L1 level. Cache hits are much more common. Cache misses that hit in the MSHR are much uh, less common. So you want to uh, maximize this, uh, minimize the latency of cache hits. So you don't want to put the MSHR on the critical path in your design. Okay, 
Any questions? Hopefully this is simple. And maybe a bit boring also. <laughs> but these are real things that you need to deal with when you want to support multiple axes in parallel. Okay, so let's go a little bit more into enabling high bandwidth memories and then that will be the last part of this cache lecture. Although this is much more general than caches, enabling high bandwidth memories. Uh, and there are multiple interesting approaches, I think, uh, very fundamental approaches. So basically, uh, the motivation, one of the motivations for high bandwidth memories is multiple instructions per cycle. Processors can generate multiple cache and memory accesses per cycle. How do we ensure the cache or memory can handle multiple accesses in the same clock cycle? That's the most aggressive case, right? Same clock cycle, you need to access uh, memory at the same time from, for the multiple addresses. And people have developed several solutions true multiporting, virtual multiporting, or time sharing a port, uh, multiple cache copies, and banking are the ones that we're going to discuss. We discussed banking uh, yesterday, and we discussed banking quite a bit in digital circuits, but we didn't discuss these three, but those three are also interesting. So true multiporting is a low level solution. Basically, you design each memory cell to have multiple read or write ports. Remember the SRAM cell that we looked at yesterday, it had two cross-coupled inverters, which are these. And it had two, uh, uh, yeah, two complementary bit lines, right? Basically, uh, two access transistors. Multiporting means add more access transistors. Now you have two ports to this. You can read or write through either port, right? That's the idea over here. So this is truly concurrent accesses. No conflicts on read accesses, right? You could actually read from both ports at the same time. Of course, the downside is now it's expensive in terms of, obviously, area, as you can see. We've increased the area by adding two more transistors. And if you want to increase the ports, you're going to add two more transistors at each. But also, we've increased the power. And we've increased the latency as well, because now the loading over here increased. You have a lot more load on this part of the circuit. As a result, your circuit is slower. And this actually increases a lot, uh, especially if you have many, many ports. So that may not be a good solution if you're constrained in terms of special latency, right? Uh, so true multiporting is employed a lot in register files because in register files, you actually truly need multiple accesses from multiple instructions if you're executing multiple instructions. But even those register files are latency uh, limited. As a result, they, they may employ some of the other solutions which we will discuss. So of course, you can have the question, what about read and write to the same location at the same time, right? Can you actually do a read from one port and write from the other port concurrently? Of course not, you'll have a conflict in the circuit, so you need actually peripheral logic to fix that. Uh, and peripheral logic may look like this. I, I found this online somewhere. Maybe it's not the nicest picture. But it basically shows that uh, you have two ports, dual port, left address and right address, and you need to ensure that those addresses do not conflict with each other. And this particular picture does it through the semaphore cells. Basically, semaphores are red and green, right, as you can see. They basically control access. If both addresses are the same and one is doing a write and one is doing a read, read you basically let only one of them go <laughs> and then serialize them. That's the idea. And that's peripheral logic. It's not, you, can, you cannot handle that over here, at least with this circuit structure. Okay, hopefully this is clear. Yeah. Okay, there's another peripheral logic, another example over here that does exactly what I said. Uh, as you can see, read or write, semaphore. Okay, let's talk about virtual multiporting. True multiporting is clearly expensive, and people didn't want to employ it uh, when they were designing, for example, the Alpha 21264 designers. They were building the, one of the fastest machines of, the, of its time, 500 megahertz, in 1996 or so, 1995 or so, actually. And they said, we want a cache that can actually sustain, uh, I believe, two accesses in parallel. Uh, but true multiporting was not good for them because they actually, cache was one of the limiting factors of their frequency at the time. So they developed uh, this idea. This idea was known, but they used this idea uh, to basically sneak in two accesses and timeshare a single port. That's the idea over here. Uh, each access needs to be significantly shorter than the clock cycle in this case. Basically, half of the clock cycle you spent for doing the first access, half of this clock cycle you spent for doing the next access. And this is used in Alpha 21264. And this, this is much better than a more expensive solution if you can actually, if, if this is satisfied, right? That's the key thing over there. 
Of course, scalability is a problem with this, right? What if you want to do eight accesses per cycle? Do you divide your clock cycle into eight? And the first eighth of the clock cycle do the first access, the next eighth do the, ne the next access, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, it doesn't scale very well. You could potentially, but now your cache needs to be really fast, right? <laughs> To, to, to fit into that long clock cycle, eight accesses. Okay, or to fit into that short clock cycle, eight accesses. But this is used in real systems, and this may come in handy when you actually need it, right? And we, when your uh, constraints uh, um, are nice. Okay, this is another uh, way of doing multiple, cache, uh, multiple access per cycle, basically copying. You, have, you copy the uh, cache into two. You have one cache copy, another cache copy, in this case, you don't touch the latencies of cells, right? That's the difference from virtual multi, uh, physical multi-porting, real multi-porting, true multi-porting. So each cache copy is the same as a single ported cache. Uh, but you have, uh, you direct the load accesses. This is the first port for the load, and this is the second port for the load. And what happens with stores? You need to maintain consistency over here, so you actually store to both locations. That's the idea. But loads can proceed in parallel over here. And this is used in Alpha 2164 cache, actually. You have two uh, copies of the cache. Make sense? What is the downside? Well, scalability is another problem over here, right? Do you actually keep copying the cache if you want eight of them? That's not a good idea, probably. Uh, this may work well if your cache is small and you need smaller ports. And also, store operations cause a bottleneck in terms of scalability, right? Whenever you have one store, you need to update all of the copies if you want to maintain consistency. And you probably want to do that. And area is proportional to the ports in this case. But latency is not bad, maybe, except for the store latency over here, right? Because you're not changing the internal structure of the cache. You're just creating it, designing it, and copying it. OK, any questions? And the last one is uh, banking, interleaving. This is actually used in register files also. In alpha 21.264, for example, you have two separate register files for the different integer units. And they actually partition the pipeline into two because of register file port considerations. They needed to actually have two instructions per cycle accessing, uh, well, four instructions per cycle accessing the cache, which means that you need to supply eight ports, eight operands per cycle from the register file. But the register file they actually designed uh, with, or they looked at with uh, eight ports was not fast enough to get 500, cycle, uh, 500 megahertz latency. So they basically had two copies of the register file, each with four ports, and they had exactly the same problems in the register file. But that, that actually exists. We are, we're, you can actually read the paper uh, on alpha 21 to 64. OK, uh, banking is another solution. Uh, if you look over here, basically, we, we actually discuss, uh, know this idea. You, add, it's, you partition the address space into separate banks. Here we copied the cache. Here we partitioned the cache. Right? So bank 0 has even addresses, for example, and bank 1 has odd addresses. That's one example. Uh, and bits and address determines which bank an address maps to. We know this very well. Based on banking, the key question is which bits to use for bank address. Uh, no increase in data store area. That's the big advantage compared to the previous solution because you're partitioning it. You cannot satisfy multiple access to the same bank in parallel. Clearly, you can have bank conflicts. And this is uh, prone to bank conflicts because you're partitioning the addresses, right? Somehow, with a pathological access pattern, you basically keep accessing only, only even addresses, right? You're always using only one bank. You're back to square one. You're only single ported in that case, right? So there is also another issue over here, which you need to have some sort of crossbar interconnect in the input and output, right? You need to have some routing logic that takes and looks at the address and sends it to the right place. So there's complexity added to the front end and the control logic over here. Because uh, you, uh, the load that's coming from the pipeline uh, over here may need to go over here because it's access to something odd. And uh, the load that's coming from the pipeline over here may need to go over here, right? So you need to do that routing. Whereas it's much more flexible if you do this. You just copied everything. Anything can go anywhere, so you don't need that complexity in the crossbar. Well, we com complexity in the interconnect. A crossbar is an easy way of handling it. Basically, crossbar means any input can be routed to the, any output, hopefully, 
uh, very quickly because there is a full connection between the input ports and the output ports over here, output banks. Okay, uh, so one issue with this is bank conflicts. You, you, can, uh, you can have concurrent requests to the same bank and if that happens, uh, the, you cannot basically parallelize. So you cannot have multiple concurrent accesses in the same cycle to the structure over here. So how do you reduce these? Uh, we've discussed this in digital circuits before a little bit, but you can have hardware techniques, software techniques. One of the techniques that we discussed actually earlier could apply here. You can do hashing, right? Basically, you, you, you have an address, physical address. Where does it map to this bank? One, one, way, one way is partitioning it based on even or odd. Or another way is actually you take the address, go through a hash function, and distribute the, access, uh, distribute the addresses across these different banks. And that gives you much better distribution than just doing even addresses go here and odd addresses go here. That reduces the pathological access patterns that you get that increase the bank conflicts. And of course, if the software is aware of the banks, then you can actually play even more tricks, but then the complexity goes into software. Uh, and then there's always a question, right? What do you uh, expose to the programmer? That's the programmer microarchitect trade-off. Who actually does this uh, mapping of the addresses? Maybe, the, the, maybe you do this and tell the programmer, if you want to get maximum performance out of the system, you'd better schedule the requests uh, that have even addresses together with requests that have odd addresses, right? That may not be very easy to do in irregular programs, especially. Okay. Okay, uh, so we've already discussed this actually, interleaving. Uh, I'm not going to go through this again, but this is essentially the same slide we discussed uh, yesterday. It's a fundamental concept, basically. There are other reasons for banking, of course, right? We just talked about enabling multiple access in parallel, but we also motivated interleaving. A single monolithic memory array takes too long to access. So as opposed to having a monolithic memory array, partition it into banks. And now you actually have a lower latency partition as opposed to too long to access single monolithic memory array. So there are multiple reasons for banking. That's why banking is very heavily employed. So if you go back and look at those solutions, uh, that we've discussed, true multi-porting. It's employed when it's really, really needed. Uh, virtual multi-porting, it's very hard to employ, especially in a scalable manner. Uh, cache copies, multiple copies of uh, the data store, it's also hard to employ in a scalable manner. But banking is employed everywhere because it's relatively easy. Uh, cost is not as high except for that interconnect complexity in the front end. Uh, but of course, you, the trade-off is you get bank conflicts. Okay, so these are some readings. I've just listed some papers over here, some of which we're going to cover. This is a paper that actually talks about caching in a modern context. If you have main memory and a DRAM cache to it, how do you actually manage it? There is a lot of recent work in that area. I'd recommend you take a look at it. This we're going to cover later on, but this is one way of generating multi, uh, uh, memory level parallelism. And we're going to talk about that later on also. And these are the papers that I mentioned earlier. So I think that finally concludes the caches. Any questions while we move to the other part of the lecture?